Today I'd like to talk with you concerning uh, the model prayer that Jesus gave to us. In fact, I've entitled today's program, The Intimacy and Power of the Model Prayer. As you may remember, the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray because they saw the power Jesus expressed whenever he prayed. So in Matthew 6, we see Jesus teaching them the outline of how to pray. So we want to review Matthew 6 here today on the program. And let's begin in verse 5. Matthew 6 and verse 5. <clears throat> and when you pray, <clears throat> not if you pray, but when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Don't be saying something you don't mean. For they love to be praying standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But God isn't about a show. He's about a relationship with us. And we're going to be talking a lot about that. In verse 6, But when you pray, go into your room, wherever you live. Close the door. You don't need to make a spectacle of it. Pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you, and he'll reward you openly. So that's an important principle. You're talking to your Father. Talk to him. Let him know what you're thinking. And do it in prayer. And Jesus is going to give us some real good ways of praying. Things to pray about. Uh, things that we would pray about knowing that we're in relationship with God the Father. In verse 7, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him, because He's our Father, and He cares about us, and therefore He knows us. He knows every hair on our head, as an example. Why would He want to know that? Well, it's because He can, and he, and he is wanting to know how we're doing in every aspect of our living. So he certainly knows what we need before we ask him. So now we've come to the model prayer outline, which is all about the Father and his will on the earth today. Are you interested? Well, I know I am. So let's continue in verse 9. Verse 9, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So our Father is a holy Father, and therefore, his name is hallowed. And it should be lifted up on high. We should be very respectful. We should pray giving him all the respect and the honor in the, in the whole world. We should approach him with reverence because he's our father. He's the father who sent the son Jesus to us to give us life through the salvation we have received through the death and resurrection of his son. So as we notice that Jesus addresses his Father as our Father, so he includes us with God the Father being our Father. You see how inclusive Jesus is, and therefore how inclusive the triune nature of God is. That is what Jesus came to the earth to establish for us in a relationship with our Father. A deep, intimate, and profound relationship with our Father in prayer. That is the example He always sets for us. If we follow His example, we will have the same results. We'll also have the power of God's answer in our lives. Because of the intimacy that Jesus has given to us with our Father. We must always remember that it's about that relationship that Jesus had with his Father. And through his death and resurrection, we have the same relationship with our Father in heaven today. Isn't that good news? It certainly is. And I hope that you feel that and appreciate that. And if you don't yet, exactly, well, hopefully you will as we go through the remainder of the broadcast today. So let's notice how God our Father is truly our Father. 
If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me over to Romans 8. I'm reading from the NIV. Romans 8, verses 12 through 17. Verse 12, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die, and that will be the end of it. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. We are his sons and daughters. If we live by the Spirit who leads us and gives us inspiration in our living. In verse 15, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, because love cast out fear, but you receive the spirit of sonship. So in the spirit of God, there's a spirit of sonship because it's all about oneness with God. We are one with God. God is one, and then God brings us into the oneness with him and calls us his sons and daughters. So therefore, there's a spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, which is a great familia expression of father. It's like calling him daddy, Abba, very emotional, very intimate, not standoffish, not father, you know, in grandfather's chair, just looking at us. No, this is an interactive father with us through Jesus. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. You see the interac interactiveness of this. It testifies with our spirit. It confirms with our spirit that we are God's children. We must expect that confirming going on on a daily basis. He's not a standoffish God to us. He's very interested in us and takes action in our lives. He cares about us. In verse 17, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So the glory that God has given to Jesus, he then gives to us, but we participate in the ministries of Jesus, which is reaching out to those poor and disadvantaged people in the earth who need ministering, who need help, who need support, who need strengthening, because that's what Jesus does through us as his disciples today, as his brothers and sisters. Then over in 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3, 1 John 3, verse 1, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. I mean, he's just given us more than we could possibly expect of his love, that we should be called the children of God. Isn't that incredible? It really is. But that's what he calls us, his children. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, in verse 2, now we are children of God, and what we shall be has not yet been made known. There's more to come. But we know that when he appears, we will shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In other words, we'll have spirit bodies ourselves when we see him at his return, when he returns to the earth, when he comes in full glory. We'll be like him, because we will, we will be spirit. We'll have spirit bodies then. So we can look upon him in his glory. Verse 3, then everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. In other words, we, we decide we want to live at a higher level of living rather than the abased or debased level of living. So that's a choice we make. We say, I want to be like you, Father. I want to be like you, Jesus, because we have that hope in us. So now let's continue with the model prayer in verse 10. Verse 10 of Matthew 6. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. In verse 12, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Verse 14, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Because remember, Jesus has brought us into the ministry of reconciliation, which is all about forgiveness. So this model should be expressed in the only prayer that we have of Jesus praying to the Father. This is found in John 17. So let's read through John 17, verses 1 through 26, and let's see if we can notice the components of the model prayer we've just read in Jesus' prayer to the Father. It would seem like they would all be there, doesn't it? And they are. But perhaps we'll be surprised in the order in which they come. We don't have to pray to God in lockstep functional performance for him to hear us. He just wants to hear our heart. So Jesus gives us some principles of prayer that we should include. We should always start out with our Father and hallowed be thy name. And we should always then use the components of the prayer, but they don't have to be exactly in that order. And we can leave out some things at different times with different prayers during the course of the day. But we need to be praying about these things because these things are the will of the Father. And Jesus said, if you pray according to the will of the Father, the power of God's answer to that type of praying will be noticeable. And you'll say, wow, thank you, dear God, for helping me in this situation. So let's go to John 17 and verse 1. After Jesus said this, he looked forward toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Well, here you go. You say we ought to give glory to the Father. Hallowed be thy name. And here Jesus says, you gave me the glory. Now help, it, help me glorify you through what he has done came and revealed the Father, set an example of how to live, and then he's now going to go to the cross, give his life for us that our sins would be forgiven, and then be raised from the dead. So that the glory that was going to be done in Jesus' life would be given to the Father. And that's how it ought to be in our living too. The glory that God does in our living through Jesus should go to the Father. We ought to be conscious of that. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you've given him. To all of those. And you've given all the world to him. He paid for the sins of the whole world. So he's given eternal life to all those you've given him. And now they just need to believe. And maybe we can be a help in helping people believe in Jesus like his disciples ought to be doing. In verse 3, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And of course, that's what all of us want to do. We want to complete the work God has given to us to do, like the Apostle Paul felt. He was doing that, you know, as he's getting toward the end of his life. And we would feel the same way as we get to the end of our living, that we've finished the task, the job that God has given us to do. That's God's will for us. In verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So again, it's all about lifting the Father up in prayer. That's what Jesus is doing, thanking him for the opportunity to do what he did for us. So, in verse 6, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now, I want you to notice that because he prays for his disciples as though they've already done everything about his word. But we realized the disciples were going to run 
away from Jesus being crucified and hide. But Jesus sees the best in us, and he prays accordingly. Today he's our living high priest. He prays for us. He intercedes for us today in this manner. I am glad for that. I hope you are too. He prays positively for us. And we need to pray positively for others. In verse 7, Now you know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. With some reservations here and there. Again, Jesus focuses on the positive with us, not the negatives. They knew a certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. So, that was yes and no. Sometimes they did, other times not so much. It's like when Peter, in Matthew 16, 16, identified who Jesus was. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, Jesus told him, Peter, you didn't come up with that answer on your own. The Holy Spirit gave you that answer. You're correct. Because it wasn't very long after that that he denied Jesus three times. And that is our humanity. And Jesus knows that. And he deals with us as a loving God today. Because he is one with the Father and one with the Holy Spirit. And they love us unconditionally today. Verse 9, I pray for them. He does. I am not praying for the world, but for those you've given me, for they are yours. So who's praying for the world today? Well, we as Christ's disciples are praying for the world we're disciples who go out and make disciples. Well, we're praying for the world. He was praying for us, though. We're praying for them, the disciples of his day. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. The glory has come to me through them. So, through his disciples, glory has come to him. And so, through us, in the same way, through the glory he's given to us to express... He receives that glory. It's passed on to him, passed on to the Father. And that's the way it works. It works you know, in a circular manner. That's what love does, never ending. Verse 11, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, Jesus, so that they may be one as we are one. Okay, so you see what is happening here. He's praying for our protection from the evil one, the devil. It's, the protection comes to the power of the name of Jesus. And therefore, if we are one as they are one, then we are working out of the place of victory. And we can stand assured that we are where we ought to be. And being protected. In verse 12, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name that you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. Verse 13, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy with them. So he gives us our daily bread through the joy he gives to us. You know, we not only have physical bread, but we eat of him, we eat of Jesus through the word, and we are satisfied in the spirit. I have given them your word. The world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am not of the world. Verse 15, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Verse 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified or set apart for holy purposes. Verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, our message today. Is it not the message of reconciliation? I hope it is. It shows God's complete love for us. That all of them may be one. See, reconciled into that oneness. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, 
May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So if we know that we are in them and they are in us, then the world will believe that the Father sent Jesus to us to save the world. Verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So God the Father loves us just like he loves Jesus. Isn't that profound? It really is. Verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you've given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Verse 25, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. And he is today. If we believe in Jesus, he lives in us through the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. So did you notice that all the components of the model prayer are included, but they are not necessarily in lockstep order? Remember, this is not a to-do list. It's a relationship. The power comes because through Jesus we can tap into God's nature of love. And love is the power of God in the universe. We have a close in intimacy with our Father because Jesus reconciled us to him through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. So let's notice that in 2 Corinthians 5 as we come to our conclusion today. In verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 5, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So we ought to be doing this because Jesus leads us to do it, inspires us to do it through the Holy Spirit. And it's all about Jesus, and therefore it's all about the Father. In verse 16, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. We no longer think that Jesus just died and that was the end of it because he was just a good teacher on the earth, because he was the Son of God and he was raised from the dead and he lives in the Spirit for eternity with the Father in heaven. We think of these things now in spiritual terms and no longer just physical terms. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, which is that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So as ministers of God's reconciliation in Christ, and the ambassadors of his kingdom on earth today, Let's be about our Father's business and advance the kingdom of heaven on earth. Please join with me in prayer. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for loving us so much that you sent us your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, that we now can also be your sons and daughters through what he has done for us. He's forgiven us of our sins and he's restored us in relationship with you. And he has been raised from the dead so that that is made to be for eternity. That is life with you for eternity. And we're so thankful. Help us now to share the good news and spread it, dear God, by being your ministers of reconciliation and the ambassadors of your kingdom on earth today. We thank you and we ask this blessing to be with us and the power of it. 
to be with us here this coming week. And we thank you in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ. And all together we say, Amen. I want to thank you for listening to the program this week. Hopefully it has been of value to you.